Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for the weekly comic book review. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. This is the weekly comic book review. It's the show where I read a lot of comic books, and I'll let you know what I thought about them, and we always start with the pick of the week. This week's pick of the week, Olympia number three from Image Comics, written by Kurt and Tony Pyers, with artwork by Alex Diotto, coloring by D. Cunniff, lettering by Michael Myers. I am loving this book. It is so good. The basic story is this. This kid's favorite comic book character comes to life, to the real world, right? And one of the things that they have to do is figure out what's going to happen next in the story, so they have to go and find the comic book creator that created this comic book. So this issue, chapter three, delves into the life of Kirby Spiegelman, the comic book creator of Olympia, the fictional comic book creator of the fictional character Olympia. Really great issue, very nuanced, very touching, um, very real, very tragically real, real life type stuff. Um, so it's really interesting to take that 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 Kirby love of his work, that dynamic, that, 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 that dynamic explosive artwork and stuff, and, and ease into something a little bit more somber, a little bit more grounded, a little bit more real. That's what Olympia number three is. And it handles that transition from fantasy to tragic realness very well, very well. Um, the Pyres, that's a father and son team, Kurt and Tony, doing a fantastic job. Alex does a great job with the artwork, and these colors are absolutely amazing. You throw in Micah's lettering, it all works. It's a nice tribute to Kirby. And like I said, not only to his comic book work, but to Kirby as a person. Lots of Kirbyisms in here, lots of great stuff. Olympia number three, pick of the week, best issue of Olympia yet. I believe it's five issues. This is the best one yet. I loved it. I loved it so much. It's the pick of the week. Olympia number three out this week. Let's jump over to Marvel. Ravencroft Institute for the Criminally Insane number one. So they've been building up into this because of the ruins of Ravencroft one shot. So we had the what the saber tooth, the Dracula, and the carnage, right? So there's like some kind of evil, malevolent force, some dark, deep, twisted history behind Ravencroft, newly rebuilt, post-events of absolute carnage. Now you got Norman Osborn involved, Wilson Fisk is the mayor, he's kind of involved, John Jameson, Misty Knight, they're involved in here. Um, it's all right. I thought the one-shots were pretty cool. I was kind of excited to lead into this and see where we're going. It was all right. It seemed a little generic. Ravencroft, they're trying to make it a little bit more menacing, a little bit more foreboding, a little bit more Arkham, but in this issue that doesn't come across, and it does kind of make its own thing, but it just doesn't engage me as much as the mystery that was being built up in those three one-shots was engaging me. So ultimately not super, super compelling. It's decent. It's not bad. It's not terrible, but it's only five issues, but I don't know if it's something I could really invest in because it's just not super compelling to me, but Ravencroft number one is out this week. Avengers of the Wastelands is out. This is kind of like a sequel to Old Man Logan slash Dead Man Logan. Ed Brisson wrote Dead Man Logan, so it makes sense that he comes back for Avengers of the Wasteland. This is Danielle Cage. This is Hulk's son. This is the new Ant-Man. It's the new Avengers of the Wasteland. So post old post dead man logan this is the next bit of the story and it's okay it didn't really hit me near as much as the last stuff the dead man logan stuff was absolutely amazing i liked old man hawkeye different creators of course and a lot of people liked old man quill different creators of course um but ed brisson's dead man logan was great but i loved it as much so much because it was it was a good story but it was also just a really great character study of Logan, right, at the end of his life. And this, you're kind of missing that. It kind of like you're taking the heart out of it. So it still has those story elements that are neat and cool, but it doesn't have the character work that we're used to with something like Dead Man Logan. So Avengers of the Wastelands, I thought was okay. If you were just fiending for more in that world, definitely pick it up, but I don't know. It was okay. So we got a few The End one-shots. First up, Captain Marvel. This one's written by Kelly um, Thompson with artwork by um, Canero, the, the typical artist. Yeah, Carmen Carmen Canero. Um, this one was okay. I thought that this one, out of all the The End one-shots that came out this week, this was the strongest, but that's not saying much. I think it's okay because you actually have a creative team behind the current Captain Marvel book of, re of the you know last year or so working on it. So it's cool. It's got some like nods here and there to Captain Marvel's history or friendships and stuff like that. It's okay. This was the best out of the one so far th today. Because you also have Doctor Strange. Doctor Strange, the end, was kind of all over the place. It was kind of boring and dull to me. It didn't really, 
didn't really get me. It just kind of felt eh, all over the place. So I didn't really like that one. And then we had the Deadpool one, which I really didn't like. So maybe hardcore Deadpool fans are going to like it. Joe Kelly coming back to tell the final Deadpool story is cool. It breaks the fourth wall. It breaks it so many different ways. It does all that cool stuff, I guess. But this was kind of obnoxious and annoying to me. And it was very verbose. And it was kind of a chore to read. So I would not recommend any of these The End One Shots from Marvel this week. But if you're super, super fans of these characters, I guess check them out. Though I do think the Captain Marvel one is probably the most decent. Amazing Spider-Man Daily. Bugle. This starts a new mini-series focusing in on the Daily Bugle. Um, Robbie Robertson, Phil Urick, um, not Phil, Ben Urick, Ben Urick, uh, Phil, yeah, that's a whole other thing. Basically, it's about the Daily Bugle struggling now. It's the modern digital age. What's going on with the Daily Bugle? It's, you know, we've seen these kind of stories before, and it's not bad. It's actually okay, but it's just okay. And this is a huge week. I'm going to be talking about a lot of comics in this video, and so in a huge week, this was kind of like kind of boring to get into and to kind of get through. But Amazing Spider-Man Daily Bugle, if you're like the biggest fan of like that Daily Bugle aspect of the of the Spider-Man story, you love those characters, you really want to see them fleshed out a little bit more and, and have a story on their own, then here you go. Ultimately though, it just didn't do much for me. That's just me. Weapon Plus has another one shot. This is World War IV. So these Weapon Plus one shots, we know about Weapon X and now we're, which is Weapon 10 and we're learning more about how each number coincides with something, right? So we know that Venom, the Venom symbiote's been used, of course, Captain America, now Man-Thing, right? So this explains Weapon 4, which is using, like, Man-Thing type stuff on a soldier. And it's okay. It's decent, I guess. So it's going to be neat once these are all done and you kind of have an explanation for every single, um, every single aspect of the Weapon Plus program, every single attempt. That's neat. You also got a backup story in here about Weapon 2, which is... Uh, cybernetic animals, kind of like We 3, but We 3 is way better, but they're okay. So if you're really following this stuff and you really like it, I would encourage you to check it out. But if you think you just want to grab this one issue and see if you like it, I don't know. I think there's stronger stuff out this week, including Thor number two. I know. We had to get through those number ones to get to this. Thor number two, the second issue of Thor from Donny Cates with artwork by Nick Klein, coloring by Matt Wilson. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it so much. Thor number one, came and just hit on January 1st, just boom, right? Donny Kate seemed to know what he was doing, have a very exciting story set up. Um, Thor number two continues that. Um, Thor and Galactus, kind of a buddy cop thing in space in a way, just a little bit, but in a Thor way. Um, I loved it. The artwork is powerful. Um, it's got uh, it's got the weight that the story demands behind it. The characterization of Thor and Galactus is spot on. Donny Cates knows these characters. He knows what he's doing. He knows this world. Very exciting stuff. He got a nod, a little bit of a nod to the DC universe in the pages of Thor number two. I like it. I'm loving it. This is big. This is boisterous. This is loud. This is what Thor should be. This is what Donny Cates on Thor should be. Two issues in, I'm loving it. I think most people are going to agree. This was a fantastic issue. Thunderous even. Thor number two out this week. And X-Men number five is finally here. X-Men number five by Jonathan Hickman with artwork by R.B. Silva. This one was kind of teased earlier in the month being like it's going to be a big deal to the future of what's coming up. There's going to be a special team, Darwin Sink and X-23. They're going to be sent on a mission and you're going to find out what that is in issue number five of X-Men. And you do. Piecing together how it is going to develop and blossom into something bigger in the future, you can see the seeds laid. Seeds have been sown. That's what they've been doing in all of these Dawn of X books. And in Hickman, Hickman's X-Men book hasn't been as... This book hasn't felt as big as I thought it would be. But when you go back and actually look at the stories and what's being set up, some big things are happening. And this is a major step forward in some interesting territory to where this story is going to unfold, how it's going to develop. I really liked it. R.B. Silva's artwork, not as strong as when he was on Powers of Ten, at least to me. His Wolverine looks a little little doofy to me. That's just me. But X-Men number five was a pretty solid issue. I really liked it. Um, and it set up some interesting stuff for the future. X-Force number six is out this week. And Benjamin Percy and company are just doing such a fantastic job on X-Force. I think this is pretty much essential if you want to keep up with X-Men. There's a lot of talk. We talked about this on the live stream on Sunday. A lot of talk about too many X titles. There are more X titles coming. We got one wrapping up. So one wrapping up, but we are getting like eight more or something like that, right? Um, for me, though, 
X-Men and X-Force are the must-reads. X-Force is so fun and I loved it. This issue has a big focus on the team as a whole and their place and kind of like a day in the life of X-Force almost in a way and a nice spotlight on Beast who's kind of now the leader of X-Force. I like this take on the team. I like this take of, of this shadowy part of Krakoa and the mutant's world and how they have to take care of things before they start and stuff like that. I love it. You got lots of action. You got lots of deep thinking. Um, really cool stuff and I'm loving X-Force. Issue number six pretty solid. New Mutants number six is here. Ed Brisson returns to the story about Angel and Beak with Glob and Armor. So that's really, really cool. Um, New Mutants number six is pretty decent. I liked it. It does wrap up that whole story. It does it in a nice way. Um, the artwork is okay. Could be a little bit more solid, but it did get the job done. Story-wise, I really do like it. I like these characters. I liked going back and focusing on some of these forgotten characters from Grant Morrison's new X-Men. Um, and I really did like it. I thought it was pretty solid. New Mutants is interesting how the switching between Hickman and Brisson. Hickman's doing the classic New Mutants in space, and Ed Brisson seems to be doing more of the newer new young mutants, right? Um, and I like that. I like kind of switching it up like that. I like the conclusion of the story, and you got some boom-boom action as well. New Mutants number six out this week. Fallen Angel Angels number six is here, and yes, I said one of the Dawn of X titles was ending, and it's this. Fallen Angels number six is the final issue. Um, I was really pumped for this when it first started. Brian Hill, really a big fan of his work. Love to see what he was going to do on this. I really liked issue number one. Issue number two was pretty decent. It started losing me. It started losing me quick. <clears throat> it's an okay ending. It's interesting. It, all in all, this was a nice character study on Psylocke, I guess, right? Some decent stuff there, but ultimately, kind of throw away. It set up some stuff interesting possibly in the future with Sinister, but nothing super integral, I think, to the ongoing story of X-Men. But it does establish Psylocke's new identity in this new post Hoxpox X world. Um, and so at least you have that. But Fallen Angels number six, kind of a lackluster ending to a lackluster series overall to me. So far, the weakest title in the Dawn of X launch. Avengers number 30 is here with the uh, Star Brand Reborn part four. We finally get the new Star Brand in here. Um, and it's, I guess it's interesting. It's okay. This Avengers run by Jason Aaron, it's not bad, but it's not really super groundbreaking. And I was really expecting the Avengers. Avengers needs to be that groundbreaking book, just like Justice League needs to be that over at DC. That's what the Avengers should be. And I feel like it's kind of been meandering around. You get for 30 issues, you've been just teasing around these different things. It's taken this long to get to the star brand. I don't know. I'm sure that Jason Aaron has a long-term plan. But right now, I just feel like we're getting lost. And this story's just getting a little bit muddy, a little bit all over the place. But maybe if I go back and do a reread, maybe it will kind of iron itself out a little bit. But this book could be a little bit more explosive and exciting. At least for me, the artwork by McGinnis is pretty solid. And like I said, Jason Aaron's not writing a bad comic book. He's just not writing the best. And Avengers should be the best or up there with the best, right? I don't know. Avengers number 30 is out this week. Also, Hawkeye, Free Fall number two, um, Matthew Rosenberg, Otto Schmidt, a fantastic follow-up issue to what was a fantastic issue number one. This book is really, really fun. I think Rosenberg's style really lends itself very well to Clint Barton. I love the artwork. It's very kinetic. It's got a nice flow across it. It's very action-packed as well. Um, I'm liking this story. There's a new Ronin in town. Hawkeye's trying to clear his name, find out who the new Ronin is, and when it, the reveal happens, it's a shocker. I really liked it. Hawkeye Freefall, number two, out this week. Immortal Hulk, number 30, is here. Seems like this book is losing steam with a lot of people out in the community. Me personally, though, I think it's kind of picking up some steam. I'm really liking this story arc. You got Joe Bennett's artwork. Seriously, it's the Hulk and family against these giant giant just kaiju monsters and I love it. I love the artwork. It's detailed. It's textured. It's all that stuff. I don't feel like this book reaches as deep as it did in its initial days. Um, it still has some elements in there. The story to me has never been the best. I thought Immortal Hulk has been okay and pretty solid. It's had its ups and downs. Right now I think it's in a cool mode. It's just big and it's explosive. It's kind of leaning. It's What's cool about this, because it's a horror book, right? But I have problems with it sometimes because it, sometimes it goes full-on horror. Then other times it's so full-on superhero, right? And it kind of has a tonal imbalance to me sometimes because of that. But one of the horrific things I like about this issue is that kaiju, we've kind of taken for granted. Dudes in rubber suits, destroying cardboard towns and stuff like that, right? Man, in here... He makes it scary, Al Ewing, the writer, and of course the art by uh, Joe Bennett and company. They make it scary. They make it horrifying. They make it chilling. Huh. 
They make it really effectively scary, and I really like that about Immortal Hulk number 30. Pretty decent, solid issue. Jessica Jones, Blind Spot, issue number two. Part two of a miniseries that's already come out digitally. It's already been released completely in graphic novel form and print. So if you don't want to wait issue to issue, you can go ahead and get that right now. However, it's a good story, good artwork. Kelly Thompson with the character of Jessica Jones knows what she's doing. And I hope that this would lead into some more ongoing, continuing Jessica Jones stories by Kelly Thompson because she does such a great job with this character. And I would hate to see this run die out after this reprint. Anyway, Jessica Jones Blind Spot, fan of the character. Highly recommend that you check it out. Conan the Barbarian number 12 is here. It's the final issue of Jason Aaron's Conan the Barbarian run. 12 issues called The Life and Death of Conan. And now we get a very satisfying conclusion. I've made it all through these 12 issues. I'm not really a Conan the Barbarian fan, so I think that is a statement about the quality of this book. Mahmoud Azrar has been on the artwork. Um, Jason Aaron's been telling a great story, and the structure of the story is telling the entire life of Conan. Jason Aaron and Azrar have been able to experiment with stories of Conan from his young days and his mid days into his older king days and stuff like that, right? And it really sets up something in the future that you'll get teased at the end of here that's kind of exciting. So Conan the Barbarian number 12 is the satisfying conclusion to what has been a really mighty fine look at Conan, his history, his legacy, and his life by Jason Aaron and Mahmoud Azrar. Hats off. Really liked it. Conan the Barbarian, number 12, out this week. Star Wars, number 2, is out this week. <clears throat> this is the series that picks up right after Empire Strikes Back. I thought issue number 1 was a very solid issue, with artwork by Jesus Sayas and writing by Charles Soule. This one gets into the question, how, do they can, how can they all of a sudden trust Lando? Well, I think one of the main story points of this new Star Wars series is going to be Luke and Leia and Chewie learning how to trust Lando, how they build that relationship. Because when Jedi starts, they're a team and they're working together. But after the end of Empire Strikes Back, they do not trust Lando. So I like the focus on Lando and what's going on there. Luke's just messed up in his head right now. This has got some nice action-packed type stuff and it fits right into the story. Overall, it's not as exciting as the first one was. It does get a little bit more clunky in its pacing at times, um, but it's all right and it's fair. I think if you're a big Star Wars fan, you're still going to like it, but this will probably be just like the Jason Aaron run, something that over time I'm going to fall out of and just go to trade waiting. But Star Wars number two, pretty solid. Speaking of solid issues, but bum we got some facsimile editions out this week. So Venom Island is here, so why not tell us some of the original story? This was a very famous cover from back in the day. I still have my original somewhere all beat up. But anyway, it's a facsimile edition of Spider-Man 347. This is one of the early Venom stories. This is the one where he gets Spider-Man trapped on an island and he thinks he kills him. This is kind of the setup for the idea of the setting of the new Venom Island story. So anyway, if you've never had a chance to read that story, you might want to pick that up. And then, of course, we got the Fantastic Four Giants King Size Special Number 6 Facsimile Edition, which is the first appearance of Franklin Richards. So that's pretty dope. I guess they're reprinting this, if I had to guess, because of the Fantastic Four X-Men book, right? This is the Franklin one, right? Yeah, of course it is. First appearance, Franklin Richards. Why did I even doubt myself? Fantastic Four, King Size Special, number six, facsimile edition, out this week. Also, they got this nifty Wolverine vs. Sabretooth 3D comic book. It reprints Wolverine number 10, I believe it is, from the 80s, his original series. Um, one of the first times Sabretooth and Wolverine ever confronted each other in the comic books. And even that X-Men movie from 2000, in the first scene with Wolverine and Sabretooth together, kind of homaged this, especially that cover, just a little bit. So if you're into the gimmicky 3D stuff like I am, you might want to check that one out. Let's jump over to DC real quick. Justice League number 39. Man, sad day. Justice League number 39 is Scott Snyder's final issue on the title. I have loved this run. I have loved this story. And what a down ending. Oh my goodness. I'm not trying to be spoilery or nothing. But if you've been reading Year of the Villain, Hell Arisen, you already know that things don't end up well for the Justice League. The Justice League run was big. It was epic. It was cosmic. And it kept raising those stakes. And it kept getting higher and higher and higher. And the threat just get, kept getting so big and imposing. It was just... An, like, just what are the Justice League gonna do? Well, this, of course, is stepping stones leading into the next big thing. We think it's something called Death Metal or Heavy Metal. It's a sequel to Metal. It's a new dark crisis on the horizon with Snyder and Capullo. This is what this has been building up to, and I love it. So excited. I love the sending. It was big. It was epic. Jorge Jimenez, I just wish he could have done the entire issue. He did the first half, and it was solid work, and I love it. I love this run, and I'm going to miss it. I really, really am. Robert Venditti starts... 
um, next issue. Justice League number 39, fantastic ending to what's been a cosmically awesome run. Justice League Dark number 19 is here. This is James Tiny in the fourth's final full issue of Justice League Dark. He will be co-writing issue number 20, which will also be co-written by the new writer, Rom V. Very excited for that. So this wraps up the whole witching war story and the first phase of what James Tynion had planned. Um, they're saying, apparently James Tynion said in a newsletter recently, that he planned on continuing to work on Justice League Dark, but they continued Batman coming out twice a month. So he had to drop it, but he's sending it over to Ram V. Um, really excited for that. But this was a great send-off, great final issue. I really did like it. I just feel like it kind of sucks because James Tiny didn't really get to tell the full story that he wanted to tell. There's still a lot of stuff out there dangling, ready to be told. <clears throat> but I'm sure Ram V is very capable of doing it. Just League Dark number 19 is out this week. Detective Comics Annual number 3 is out this week. This has got a story. It's just a single issue story. Um, Peter Tomasi, but it's got artwork by Sumit Kumar. That's right, Sumit Kumar from The Savage Shores. The artwork in this book is fire, and it's a great story. It's a story about Alfred's spy past. Bruce uncovers a part of Alfred's past he didn't really know about before. Really interesting, very well done. I love the artwork. If you loved the artwork in These Savage Shores, pick this up and see what his take on Gotham is. I loved it. Thought it was great. Really liked this issue. Um, focusing in on Alfred, I mean, on Batman kind of moving forward a little bit post Alfred's death but this was a great issue and I really liked it and like I said that artwork was solid it was dope you also got a backup story in there with artwork by Eduardo Rizzo um that's great stuff too so Detective Comics annual number three do not miss that one that one's really good Action Comics 1019 oh man this book sucks I do this book sucks I've tried to stick with the Bendis Superman stuff Superman is tolerable I would say right now Action Comics right now is just, what, what is this? It's got artwork by John Romita Jr., right? And it is the most rushed, sloppy artwork from him I've seen in a while. And I hate to be, like, nagging on the book, but this book was terrible. I hated this. I hated this so much. I don't even want to describe what happened in it, because I hated it so much. Action Comics 1019. I'm off of that. Flash, number 87 is here. This book is great. This is kind of like an aftermath issue from Rogue's Reign. Really good stuff. Flash is now in deep trouble because the Speed Force powers are too excessive in him. They got to wrap that stuff up. Um, Captain Cold. Um, the Rogue's Reign story was absolutely fantastic. Joshua Williamson has been doing a fantastic job on Flash ever since he started this run at the very beginning of Rebirth in 2016. So Flash for 87 issues has been really solid under the guiding hand of Joshua Williamson. you got great artwork in here by Christian Duche. I um, really like this stuff. Flash has just been keeping that momentum, keeping that pace. This book has been getting better and better as it goes. This was a great epilogue to the Rogue's Reign. Really set up some cool stuff for the future. Had a very enticing ending, and I'm very excited for the next issue. Very, very excited. Green Lantern Black Stars number three is here. This is the final issue of the three-issue series that spans between the Green Lantern and the Green Lantern season two. So season two starting soon. So this wraps up the whole Black Star story, the whole alternate reality, other world story that's been going on. If you haven't been reading Green Lantern by, uh, by Grant Morrison, you're going to be lost if you've just been reading this one. It's all one story and it's all been great. Crazy, kooky ideas, a lot of meta commentary at times on the comic book industry, but I've been liking it. Green Lantern Black Stars number three was a very satisfying conclusion and a nice setup, and I'm interested to see what happens in season two, which starts very, very soon. Let's go over to Boom Studios. Something is killing the children number five. Man, if Olympia didn't come out this week, this might be the pick of the week. Something is killing the children number five is not only one of the best comic books that came out this week. It's one of the best comic books of the month so far which by default of the year so far. And it's the best issue of Something is Killing the Children yet, at least in my opinion. The coloring by Miguel Muerto is absolutely flawless and perfect in tone and the uh, balance that it brings to the page. Werther, Werther del, Eder, Eder, del Edera? Yeah, Werther del Edera, I believe. Artwork, fantastic, very effective at capturing that atmosphere. But James Tynion, phew, this is some of the best work from him, period. Period. I love it. The dialogue flows in conjunction with the excellent composition and storytelling and sequential flow of the story that Del Edera is throwing in there. It works so cohesively together. This book, though, really hits a turning point in the story. Some things get revealed. Action really starts ramping up. And the horror gets more brutal and guttural and just... 
horrific. This book is disturbing. I really liked it. It hit me though. There's a moment in this book that is so rough, y'all. Something is Killing the Children, number five though, is not rough in its execution. Such a great book. Go Go Power Rangers is here with issue number 28. Um, a nice little fun uh, one and done story kind of focusing in on what happened to Rita and her minions when they were in that space dumpster, when they were imprisoned by Zordon. And it's a really interesting take on what that is. I don't want to spoil it for Ranger fans out there, but I will go ahead and continue to say that the Power Rangers books right now are the absolute best Power Rangers story that we have ever gotten. And that includes all comic books, that includes all the TV shows. This is the best. This stuff is amazing. Great character studies. And now you're giving me great character studies, brilliant character studies on Rita and Goldar and Babu and Squat and Finster. And they're doing the Babu, Squat, Finster and Goldar stuff with so little uh, space. F fantastic. Go Go Power Rangers number 28 is out this week. Let's look at Vault. Vault has some titles out this week. Vagrant Queen, A Planet Called Doom, number one. This is the second volume of Vagrant Queen. Vagrant Queen is a book by Magdalene Visaggio and Jason Smith. I really like it. It's kind of space opera. It's about this woman who is like an intergalactic princess and she's like, shove it. I don't want your job. She's just out there trying to live her life. But of course, she gets wrapped up in all this stuff all the time. The first volume was cool. Um, I really did like it. Um, and it is Jason Smith, right? I don't want to miss... Yeah, Jason Smith, uh, colored by Harry Saxon. Um, I really like Jason Smith's artwork. It's not going to be to everybody's taste, but I think it's very effective at the uh, tone of the story. I love the first arc, and so I'm really excited about the second. And I'll say this, the first issue of the second arc of Vagrant Queen is way more solid than any issue of Volume 1, in my opinion. I really do like it. It's soon to be a sci-fi channel series on TV. They've been filming it. I'm very excited. I think it debuts this summer. Um, so Vagrant Queen, A Planet Called Doom, if you're a big fan of the original, I highly recommend you check out the second volume. That is out this week from Vault Comics. Also, Black Stars Above, number three. Um, this issue, Black Stars Above is something I'm really liking. It's got cosmic Lovecraftian horror. And it's building up the sense of, of, of existential dread and insanity. And it's doing a very masterful job of that at times. But at other times, because so much of this is through a journal, through narration, sometimes it gets a little verbose. And to me, especially with the cursive that's used in the, the lettering, it gets a little, it gets a little like, it, it slows the pace just a little too much. Just a little too much. And then in this issue, you have like four or eight pages of the journal alone. And it was kind of, I read 41 comics this week, so it's kind of a chore to get through those ones. I'm still liking Black Stars Above. I think it does a great job when it when it hits, but it doesn't always hit, and sometimes it takes too long to build to those moments that do hit. That's my only criticism criticism right now. Um, I am liking the book, though. I think the artwork is absolutely fantastic, and I think the writing's pretty decent, but it just kind of slows itself down so much sometimes with the with the journal and the narration and all that kind of stuff. But Black Stars Above number three is out this week. Cult classic creature feature number four is here, and this is not a book I would ever accuse of having pacing issues. This book has, from the very start, pressed the pedal to the metal, and it has not let up. This is a great fun, cheesy 80s horror movie type thing. It's got that vibe. It's it's brutal. It's grotesque. It's 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 outlandish. It's so much fun. And it's also truly just gruesomely horrifying. This book is great. It's got it all. If you love cheesy sci-fi horror stuff, you're gonna like this. But the book itself does go into that cheesy vein, but it is not a cheesy book. The characters are real. The tragedy is real. The scope of it is real. This book is Man, you can tell that Elliot Rahal and John Bivens and company are having so much fun with this, and so am I. Cold Classic Creature Feature number four out this week. Mall number five is here from Gary Dobberman and Michael Morisi, Zach Hartong, and Addison Duke, and Jim Campbell rounding out that creative team. This is the final issue of Mall, Mall number five. It uh, brings it to a very satisfying conclusion. I really like uh, Hartong's artwork. It's not going to be to everybody's taste, but it's it really fits that frantic tone and style that's appropriate to this book. I really liked it. It's kind of like Dawn of the Dead meets the Warriors. It's a very satisfying ending that does leave itself open for more, and I would like to see more. Just saying, if anybody's interested. Anyway, Maul was a really fun book, and I really liked it, and I really liked the way it looked at human divisiveness and polarity, and it did it in a very fun, homage way. Two stories like The Warriors and Dawn of the Dead was never 
but never felt derivative. I don't know. Mall number five out this week. Loved it. From Image Comics, we got a new one, Protector. Protector number one. This one is written by Simon Roy and Daniel Benson, and it's got artwork by Art Yum um, Trakhanov and coloring by Jason Wordy. Um, I love the art in this book. Absolutely love the art in this book. And get that out of the way. The book itself is pretty interesting. It's okay. However, the whole thing is just a very light setup in world building, setting up this world. So it's like a post-apocalyptic world. This is up in the north near the Great Lakes. It's like the year 3000 and something, and it's about how mankind has gone through a disaster and has kind of picked themselves back up, and you got these different tribes and different communities and these interesting weird beings there. And so you, you, there's a lot of back matter that really explains out a lot more about this world. But all the first issue did was barely set it up. That's it. We don't have really a huge flow going into it right now. Nothing super grabbing me or compelling. But it wasn't a bad comic book and the artwork was cool and it did great for what it did. Maybe this should have been a double size issue. We'll see what happens in issue number two. But Protector number one was pretty decent. But it really just feels like half of the setup. At least to me. Redneck number 25. Wow. Donny Cates and Redneck number 25, which is its triumphant return starting a new story, um, basically tells us the origin of vampires. And it's an interesting origin. Um, it's similar to other origins that have been um, brought about in fiction, but it handled itself very well. Lissandro Estherin, D. Cunniff on the artwork, I really do like this book. It's great. Redneck. It's about redneck vampires. Get it? Um, but the book is really good. And the, the aim and scope of this book keeps getting wider as each story progresses. And this one, it gets damn near biblical. It does get biblical. In a way. Anyway, The Origin of Vampires, according to Donnie Cates here in Redneck number 25. I loved it. Ice Cream Man number 17 is here with an Ice Cream Man look at the mythos of Superman. You got a little bit of Lex Luthor in there, some Grant Morrison-y type stuff. You got a bunch of tributes, not only to Superman, but to All-Star Superman and to Grant Morrison in particular. And I'm pretty sure that Martin, Martin Morazzo is intentionally drawing Lex Luthor to look like Grant Morrison. Because... You should. Chris O'Halloran's artwork is amazing. W. Maxwell Prince's stories are good. Not my favorite issue of Ice Cream Man because it feel like it kind of got a little too meta, almost, talking about Superman. I don't know. It was good, and I like the explorations that are done, but it's not your typical Ice Cream Man story. But it's still interesting. So if you're an Ice Cream Man fan like I am, you're going to be interested in this one. It's going to be interesting. It's cool. It's kind of neat. It's, it's Superman done by Ice Cream Man. I don't know. I really liked it, though. Pretty good. Ice Cream Man number 17 is out this week. Farmhand is out this week with issue number 13. A very revelatory issue. Lots of revelations. Lots of stuff gets revealed, gets set up, gets explained. And it's doing it in a very great way. The concept of this one alone sold me at first. But Rob Guillory has kept me involved with interesting human drama. Um, character interaction, especially between the, the family and the business and, and the mystery, right? So it's about a seed that you can grow body parts out of and then how that kind of starts spreading and not being so cool. And a lot about the mystery of how this came about is explained in Farmhand number 13. Rob Guillory's doing such a great job with this one. This book is fun, absurd, grotesque, and the, it's anchored by great character work in this family. Farmhand number 13 out this week. Criminal number 12 is here and I believe this wraps up the current run of Criminal. Um, an interesting ending. Um, it's nice to see all these different stories that have been going on kind of come together and culminate in this ending. Um, very satisfying, very very crime fiction, very film noir-ish, um, but Criminal has been amazing. I've only read these 12 issues. I've never read any of the stuff that came before and now I 100% got to jump in there and check all that stuff out because this has been such a great run and I love this conclusion. Very satisfying. Um, Ed Brubaker, Sean Phillips, when they're working together, they can do no wrong. Very excited for Pulp, which is a new one coming out. Criminal number 12, though, is out this week. From Valiant Comics, we got Quantum and Woody number one. Um, I'm a big fan of Quantum and Woody. I really like that last series, especially because they used the retro foil artwork from the 90s. Um, and I love, love, love the Christopher Priest stuff from back in the day. Um, this one's okay. It was very wordy. The artwork was kind of clunky. It kind of got a little cluttered, a little overstuffed. It was kind of difficult to get through, so I can't really recommend this. But I would recommend you going back and getting those trade paperbacks or whatever and check out the Christopher Priest Quantum and Woody run because that's really good stuff. This one, though, I'm just kind of okay. Paradox here is a one-shot from Source Point Press and Comics Experience, and the whole thing is told like this. It's by Philip Seavey, 
who did recently triage over at Dark Horse. So this is a one shot that's actually very well done. It's about this paradoxical person who gets sent into the past, falls in love with his mother, and becomes his own father, and it's this time loop type thing. But so you got three different stories going on at the same time, and they all kind of come together and tie itself up in a nice knot. But Paradox, really, really cool. It might be one of your sleeper hits of the week. This is probably not going to be readily available in most shops. So if you don't see it at your shop, request it, see if you can get it. But if you like interesting, innovative comic books that do different things and cool sci-fi concepts and stories, um, I recommend this and I really like the artwork. I really like the artwork. I thought his artwork was decent in triage, but it's really good in Paradox. I actually really like that one. I thought that was pretty solid. Also from Source Point Press, we have a horror double feature. It's a one shot. It's got a story I learned a lot from my old man. It's got a story called The Painting. The, uh, the first story is okay. Didn't really do that much for me. It kind of was a little cliche, a little predictable. Um, the painting, though, was really cool, and I really liked it. So if you like a good Tales from the Crypty type horror story, definitely check this one out if you like that kind of stuff, anthology horror. Um, I'd like to see more of this. That would be cool stuff. Um, like I said, the first one was okay, but the second one I really liked. I really liked that a lot. That one was from... Uh, Joshua Werner. I'd like to see more work from that cat. That was really cool. Speaking of Source Point Press, Misplaced number three is out this week. Man, I'm loving this book. It's esoteric. It's cool. It's weird. It's, it gets deep. It gets deep into the nature of reality and purpose and what is a human soul and things like that. Really like it. The basic premise is this. This dude dies, gets to the afterlife. His soulmate's not there. Hey, I've been waiting my whole, you know, what, where's she at? Where's she at? Oh, we don't know. What do you mean you don't know? We don't know. Some souls just don't make it. What do you mean? Send me back. I want to find her. So it's, a, it's kind of like a reverse What Dreams May Come or whatever. Is that the name of the movie? The Robin Williams movie? Yeah, What Dreams May Come. I really like that movie. Anyway, misplaced number three is kind of like a reverse version of that. So we get sent back to Earth trying to figure out this thing. You got this person who's like capturing souls. She's figured out how the universe works or so she thinks. She's trying to... Lots of crazy cool stuff. Beautiful artwork. Beautiful. Beautiful. Beautiful artwork. I love this artwork. And I love the story. Like I said, it's esoteric, it's challenging, um, and it questions a lot about reality and myth and belief and love and souls. I don't know. I liked it. Misplaced number three. Love in that book. And finally, let's talk about Frankenstein Undone number one from Mike Mignola, Scott Ollie, and Ben Stenbeck with Brennan, Brennan Wagner on the coloring. Um, I love it whenever Stenbeck works with Mignola. Great stuff. So Frankenstein's kind of like Mignola's sequel to the book Frankenstein. So after Frankenstein is over the novel, where does he go? Now there's already been one of these books. I think that was Frankenstein Underground. Um, and now this is undone. Even if you haven't read the last one, you can read this one. It's all right. It starts off kind of slow, but then it really picks up. And I really did like it. So it's basically just Frankenstein's monster trying to find his place in the world. But I like it. It's got that Mignola touch and Ben Stenbeck's artwork. Flawless. My favorite Mignolaverse artist outside of Mignola is this cat right here. Anyway, I've been waiting for this book to return and now it's here and I'm super excited. Anyway, that's what I read this week. That's what I thought about it. What are you reading? What are you excited about? Let us know in the comments down below. Let's keep the conversation going and talk about the comic books that we love. Thank you so much for checking out the video. Please do like, share, and subscribe and join us over at popculturephilosophers.com for podcasts and a whole lot more. I've been Rockin' Robbie Billups. Thanks for rocking with us. Keep on reading.